Good evening and welcome to Scotland at 7 here on Broadcasting Scotland. My name's Kenny McBride and I'm joined this evening by two excellent guests. Firstly, uh, from the All Under One Banner organisation, we have Andrew Wilson. Andrew, how are you doing this evening? Kenny, good evening. I'm fine, thank you. I hope you're well too. I'm not bad. And on the other side of me, I guess we've not had on for quite a wee while, but delighted to have her back, is Dr Philippa Whitford MP. And Philippa, how are you doing? I'm fine, thanks very much, Kenny. Excellent. Well, we start this evening, as we always do, with our coronavirus statistics update. And as of 2pm today, a total of 371,065 people in Scotland have been tested through NHS Scotland Labs and UK Government Regional Testing Centres. Of these, 352,348 were confirmed negative, 18,717 were positive. Today in Scotland, there were 23 new confirmed cases of COVID-19 but again, another day with no new reported deaths of people who have tested positive. This will be an underestimate of the total number of cases as not everyone with the virus will display symptoms and not everyone will necessarily get themselves tested. Although again, we do urge you, if you are showing any symptoms, please do book a test as quickly as you can. Of the people who have tested positive, there were 270 people in hospital last night, four of whom were in intensive care. The number of patients in Scotland who have died from complications caused by the coronavirus infection remains at 2,491. This number only includes those who have died in hospital having received a positive test for the virus. The latest UK daily figures available show that 46,299 patients who tested positive for COVID-19 have sadly died from their illness, an increase of 89. This number refers to deaths in all settings, not just those in hospitals. And as it's Tuesday, we also have the Office for National Statistics report for England and Wales for the week ending 24th of July, which was week 30 of the year. For the sixth week in a row, the ONS report shows total deaths in England and Wales for the week slightly below the five-year average for this time of year, and again driven by deaths in hospitals and care homes being well below average, while deaths at home almost completely counterbalance those lower figures. The total number of deaths registered in the week related to COVID-19 was 209 for England and 7 for Wales. These are the lowest totals since week 12 back in March. Again though, this weekly tally is significantly below the combined daily tally for that week, which stands at 444. We will continue to monitor this statistical anomaly and bring you any further insights as we get them. Uh, but before we go on, I just want to remind you, if you do want to be a part of the conversation here on Broadcasting Scotland, you can do that by following us on Twitter at Broadcast Scott and then tweeting using the hashtag Scotland at seven. You can see on the screen right now, we will be bringing up some of those tweets throughout the show. So do please get involved. Uh, but our first story today is uh, results uh, from the SQA. School students across Scotland received their national and higher results today after exams were cancelled for the first time ever due to the coronavirus pandemic. Pass rates overall were up but there has been some contro controversy over how grades were calculated by the Scottish Qualifications Authority. Around 133,000 grade estimates submitted by teachers were subjected to SQA moderation which raised 6.9% of moderated grades, but lowered grades in 93.1% of cases. The methodology, excuse me, the methodology used to do this gave a lot of weight to previous performances at school level, meaning that students at schools in the most deprived areas were more than twice as likely to have a grade lowered as students at schools in the least deprived areas. Some students with impressive grades in coursework and in prelims have been sharply downgraded, leading some to feel that they are being held responsible for their school's historic poor performances. Scottish Green Education spokesperson Ross Greer MSP has slammed the SQA for what he called the disturbing and grossly unequal results of its grading system, calling for the exams authority to appear before Parliament immediately to explain what has happened. The SQA and the Scottish Government have assured students and teachers that there will be an open appeals process with special priority given to those needing particular grades to secure a university place. Uh, so, uh, Philip, I'll come to you. Uh, does anyone in your family uh, facing the exams coming out or results coming out today? Uh, no, my son is thankfully past that, but uh, I remember it well when he was going through it. And actually, despite my age, I remember... Uh, I remember opening my grades in fifth year for hires, trying to get into medicine, and I missed getting into medicine by four marks. I'd done quite a lot of hires, I got really good results, but just in one subject, didn't get what I needed. And 
So I can remember how heartbroken people feel. Um, but I managed to turn it around in sixth year and I did get in and, you know, it's a long time ago I went on and had my career in medicine. But, you know, I know exactly how traumatic it feels um, and how nervous young people will have been opening these envelopes today. Yeah. Um, Andrew, um, I know you are you have some uh, family connections in education. Um, what's been the, the feeling uh, from from your, your, your wife and others about how these results have been uh, collated? Uh, from educators that I've spoken to today so far, uh, the feeling is that uh, in, a, in a year such as this, uh, there would always have been uh, an attempt by others to make political capital out of the results of the exams, whatever those results would have been. Uh, teachers have faced, uh, un, uh, have faced challenges the like of which they've never faced before. Young people have faced incredible challenges this year, especially ones in their final years at school. Uh, and so the, the, the SQA's approach uh, would always have found itself under challenge. Uh, I think that insofar as we can see that the grades uh, have increased slightly uh, is, is, is testament to everyone's hard work and commitment, especially when education and teaching this year and learning this year have changed so very, very much. Uh, I think that so long as there, is, there, there would always have been appeals and so long as the appeals process is robust and, and is transparent and I know that schools do everything that they can to make that the case, uh, then I, I'm, I'm hopeful that, I'm very hopeful that uh, ultimately we will get to a place where the results accurately reflect as well as possible uh, what would have been the outcome this year. But I do recognise and I do respect the concern that because there hasn't been uh, our normal uh, examination process, there may be a component which has led to the the, the continuation of some of the inequalities uh, in the education system that Scotland has had for decades uh, and which are taking some time and some considerable investment to address. So it's not perfect, but I think in such a difficult year as this, I think uh, most educators I've spoken to are recognising that this is the best of a very difficult job. Yeah. Um, Philippa, this is uh, obviously there's there's always concern about uh, grade inflation and, and so on when uh, pass rates continue to rise. And we have seen pass rates rise uh, by four to between four and six percent, depending on what type of qualification it was. Um, do you think that this this moderation process that the SQA has done is has been the right thing to do? Well, I think if you if you look at the estimates um, where, you know, there were some of the, if you like, the grades compared with previous performance would have jumped up 25 or 30 percent, then I think you would have had that attacked in the media saying clearly these qualifications are worthless, it's all just been made up. So I think it was a no-win situation for the SQA. I think the important thing is that appeals will not cost schools. It will be an open process. And they're particularly for young people who've done prelim, who had coursework that can you know, clearly be verified. You know, I would hope that then teachers will appeal on their behalf because certainly we don't want that young people are, are if you like, burdened with the past performance of their school. But the idea that grades would change by 30% in one year is more than we would achieve. The attainment gap has been closing. The young people from the, the most deprived 20% getting to university has been increasing and we want that to continue. But I think it is important that the grades would be given a value. Um, I think the SQA has tried to do that, but I think what we need now is the fine adjustment to make sure that there are not young people particularly from more deprived backgrounds who have performed well and feel they should have had a higher grade and their teachers feel they should have a higher grade. They should have a very low threshold to appeal and see if that can be adjusted. Mm. Yeah, well, we will obviously keep an eye on that appeals process as it uh, comes along. Uh, the number of Scottish domiciled students being offered a place at Scottish universities is the second highest on record, up 1% to 28,240. UCAS data published today also shows the number of acceptances from the 20% most deprived areas in Scotland to UK universities increased to a record high of 4,360. 
Higher Education Minister Richard Lockhead said, Congratulations to everyone who has secured a place at university. The increase in acceptance for Scottish students from all backgrounds gaining a place at a Scottish university is very encouraging, especially given the past few difficult months. The figures also show that the number of people from the most deprived areas being accepted to university is at a record high. We want every young person in Scotland to have an equal chance of success no matter their background or circumstances, and I am pleased we continue to make steady progress here. For anyone disappointed with the results, the SQA's appeals process is now open. The clearing process is also now live and places are still available for those who want to study in Scotland. Uh, so, Andrew, I mean, for all we've seen criticism of the, the process today, um, this is good news, isn't it? We are seeing more people going to university and a, a, at least a small closing of the, the attainment gap. Definitely, Kenny. We, we know that Scotland has one of the most highly educated populations in the world. The proportion who, uh, who obtain qualifications from tertiary education is, is comparatively high in Scotland. Uh, and uh, we know the value that is placed uh, on education uh, uh, in, in Scotland as well. And so to see continuing improvement, especially in these difficult areas and areas where we know that the, the, the value of of persistence and investment uh, uh, pays dividends for for all of us, for the for the, for the young people involved, and for our communities and for our population as a whole. Uh, I think these 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 figures are encouraging, and I, I hope they are seen in what, as I say, it was saying, has been a, a very difficult year. The, the, the success in this, the continuing success in this area, is seen as an encouragement to others uh, to. Uh, to stick in in their education and to persist uh, and to obtain the qualifications that they deserve. Yeah. Um, and Philippa, in amongst this, uh, this data from UCAS today, we've seen a substantial drop in the number of students from uh, other EU countries uh, applying to, to study in Scotland. How big a concern is that for uh, the, the university sector as well as for, uh, obviously, Scotland's international connections and profile? Well, I think for our international connections across Europe, I think that is disappointing and obviously is a direct result of, of Brexit, which is, which is coming. Uh, because obviously people who have studied, spent maybe four years in Scotland, you know, they develop a relationship with Scotland, which bears fruit later in life, whether it's through business connections, academic connections, or simply a friendliness towards Scotland. But obviously EU students study here without paying large fees. So it's not so much that they would be major contributors to university income. They study in the same way as Scottish students do. But obviously what we've seen, and this is more related, of course, to COVID rather than Brexit, is, is the huge drop in international students who do normally pay quite high fees and therefore do contribute significantly to university income. And I think that will be more of a concern and I think universities will have to be quite creative to think about, you know, can they attract uh, people to online courses, etc., through their universities if people are unable or unwilling to come to Scotland during the pandemic. Mm -hmm. We do just want to say congratulations to everybody um, who's who's had their results today. Uh, if you don't feel like you got what you, you expected or what you deserved, then as we've said, the appeals process is open. Do talk to your teachers. Um, look online. There's lots of advice available there for if you if you want to know how to how to proceed. And remember as well that these are not it's not the end of the world. If you didn't get the results that you wanted, um, you will have most most people in fifth year will have another chance to sit hires in sixth year. Uh, those of you in fourth year, you know, your hires are going to be the, the really big decider anyway. Uh, and then there's always further education and whatnot available uh, if you want to try and pursue higher education through another route. So if I could, uh, can I just say, yeah, I mean, certainly. I, you know, obviously we're talking about um, university and, uh, you know, as, as Andrew was saying, you know, 45% of Scots have a higher national qualification or degree. We are a very highly educated and qualified population. But that isn't all university degrees. And I think sometimes we focus a bit too much on universities, young people looking for a career in one of the technical specialties like engineering will actually sometimes do better getting an apprenticeship 
and then the company they work with may even pay them to do a degree. So, you know, there's lots of paths. There isn't just a straight line uh, from one end to the other. So people who didn't get everything they want, there's lots of different options open to you. And I think it's important that we value further education, technical education, and all the other routes in life that young people may choose to follow. Oh, absolutely. Um, my mum my always said I should have taken up an apprenticeship. She said, you'd never meet a poor plumber. Uh, so, yeah, there's, there's lots of options. You never meet a plumber full stop. <laughs> We, we do move on now, uh, and uh, a story that Philippa, I'm sure, will be able to speak to. The SNP has said that the Tory government is putting its Brexit obsession ahead of the health and livelihoods of millions of people across the UK, as pharmaceutical companies are urged to stockpile drugs before the transition period ends on the 31st of September. Dr Philippa Whitford MP said the Tory government was negotiating a bad deal that would leave Scotland poorer and worse off. The SNP's Shadow Health Secretary added that the only way to protect Scotland's interest and EU membership was to become an independent country. Last month, a report from experts at Warwick University found Scotland is already £3.94 billion worse off as a result of Brexit, the equivalent of £736 poorer per person. Separately, Scottish government analysis has revealed that ending the transition period in 2020 could cut £3 billion from the Scottish economy in just two years, on top of the impact of coronavirus. Uh, now, Philippa, this obviously is a story that you've been talking about ever since, well, before the, the Brexit vote even happened, um, this risk that drugs uh, may not be available to people in the UK because they're produced in Europe and uh, imports are necessarily going to become more difficult. How big a problem is this really? Well, I mean, I spent my time in 2016 when I was campaigning uh, for Remain very much talking about the health impacts of Brexit, which were being utterly overlooked at the time. And that includes our European workforce that's here, the right we have to health insurance within Europe, the research we do with European counterparts, particularly this issue of medicines, but also radioisotopes, which I've been raising since 2016. Now, pharmaceutical firms were asked to stockpile at least six weeks of drugs last year, coming up to the potential of a no deal exit in March. And they were asked to stockpile three months of insulin because the UK doesn't produce insulin. Now, obviously, a lot of these stockpiles will have been used up in the normal cycling of, of drugs, but also a lot of these stockpiles have been used up during the pandemic. And so while the government have told the pharmaceutical firms to do this again, a lot of them are saying, you know, there's so much shortage of um, medical supplies across the world that they can't just easily throw stockpiles together. Now, back in 2018 and 2019, people were complaining of drug shortages already, certain uh, brands or certain types of drugs that people were struggling to get. And that's because there's only two ways you can stockpile. You either increase your production, which is not always possible, or you set a little bit aside out of each batch. And that setting aside for some drugs can actually generate a shortage. Now, we've literally got a matter of months before we could be completely out of the single market. There will be friction at the border. It will affect drugs. And, and it's very difficult to see how the government at this late stage can say there won't be any drug shortages. The particular thing about radioisotopes, which we use in cancer diagnostics and in treatment, is you can't stockpile them. They literally cease being radioactive within a matter of hours or days and become useless. So, you know, they went through that process early 2019. They would need to be going through that process again, but we're in the middle of a pandemic. And um, <clears throat> do you think then that the, the UK government has just been asleep at the wheel and hasn't done the, the necessary preparations for this? Well, it's hard to know. I mean, some of it is probably asleep at the wheel that they should have been looking at this much earlier, particularly when they already started saying back in January that they categorically would not extend the transition period. They put it in their withdrawal act. So they should have already been looking then at what is the impact. So before we knew about COVID, before it was hitting, um, there was no talk about that. 
And so we've no idea whether they even were thinking about these preparations. Of course, everyone has been working on COVID and therefore civil servants and others would have struggled to have the bandwidth to be thinking about what's coming with Brexit. And that's the whole reason why we've been pushing for the transition period to be extended. Businesses are reeling, some of them are struggling to survive. And the idea that they can get through this COVID crisis and then just be hit with a very hard deal with Brexit uh, at the end of the year, because this government are only asking for quite a hard deal. So that's what you get at best, and at worst you get no deal at all. Mm. Now, I, I have diabetes, uh, amongst other conditions, uh, and I have been kind of just getting a wee bit ahead of myself on, on my prescription so that I do have a wee bit of a extra in the fridge. Uh, is that something that you would recommend people do with regular medication or, you know, try and set a wee bit aside? Or is this something that uh, you, you, you would think people can rely on governments and, and pharmacies to, to manage for them? I think it's a, a topic to discuss with your GP or your pharmacist. What, what are they hearing about supplies? The problem is, is if everyone does that, if everyone sets a little bit aside in their fridge, you actually then create shortage. So it's a bit like at the start of lockdown when everyone went crazy for toilet roll and flour and yeast and you couldn't get it and yet actually there was no issue with supply at all. So it, I can understand the anxiety about it, particularly for diabetics. I'm hoping that that is one that they will be getting under control very quickly. Um, but I think that it, we wouldn't want that everyone was just setting aside double the amount of drugs or getting two prescriptions mm. at once because that would create a shortage right now. It's mm. really this has to be thought of by pharmacists, by GPs and particularly by government. Yeah, yeah. On the, on the insulin question, it was the one reason I was slightly happier with Theresa May than uh, any other option as Prime Minister because I felt she would at least make sure that insulin supplies got through. Um, on the question of um, how we how we get past this, you you've mentioned in that statement uh, that the the cost of of Brexit and that the only way out of this is is through independence. How quickly do you think that can happen, given that we are still in the middle of a pandemic? Uh, that Brexit is going to hit Scotland hard, regardless of of how how this year plays out. Um, do you think independence can relatively quickly? get us back on an even keel? Well, obviously, independence itself would take time. Uh, I think the election next year is absolutely critical to that. Um, while I know people agonise completely over you know, the paperwork and what Boris Johnson says or doesn't say, in actual fact, to me, the thing that holds us back is not Boris Johnson. It's actually that almost half the people in Scotland are not yet convinced, do not yet believe that their country could be better than it is now. And indeed my fear, I mean, in 2014, I believe Scotland could be better than this. My fear now looking at what's happening in Westminster, looking at Brexit is actually, we could be an awful lot worse than this. So we still have a job to convince people, but if we were successful in that uh, election next year, you know, you could hold a referendum relatively quickly but it would still take you time to transition out of the UK. But I would hope that we would then be declaring to Europe, you know, we want to come back in, we are committed Europeans, and we might be able to get put reasonably quickly in some kind of associate uh, position that would allow us to not get dragged too far away from Europe. But that's the importance of things like food standard change, trade deals with America is the standards in Scotland being dragged further and further away from Europe and therefore making it a further journey to get back to those standards so that we can get into Europe. Mm. Well, we move on to another economy story and the SNP has renewed calls to extend the furlough scheme and devolve financial powers to the Scottish Parliament needed to protect jobs. As Pizza Express and Dixon's Carphone became the latest companies to announce job losses amid the ongoing pandemic. The news that up to 2,000 jobs could go at the leading companies follows 2,600 redundancies announced yesterday at the retail and gym chain DW Sports and tour operator Hayes Travel. 
Alison Fulis MP said the Tory government would bear the blame for thousands of job losses if it continued to cut the furlough scheme prematurely and withhold the powers and funds Scotland needs to protect jobs. The SNP's Shadow Chancellor said if Westminster won't act then it must devolve the powers so Scotland can get on with the job. Last month, the Office for Budget Responsibility warned UK unemployment could surpass the peaks of the 1980s after weaker than expected economic growth and the UK manufacturing sector warned of a jobs, jobs bloodbath in the autumn. Analysis for the Office for National Statistics found the UK economy is 24.5% smaller than it was in February, with 650,000 fewer people employed. Separately, the British Chambers of Commerce quarterly recruitment outlook revealed almost a third of firms expect to axe jobs over the third quarter, a record high. Uh, and Andrew, we have discussed this on the show a number of times, uh, but this winding down of the furlough scheme just seems to be coming at exactly the wrong time for a lot of businesses. They're not able to open up yet, but the, the support that they're getting to keep people in those jobs is being cut and they're now having to start redundancy proceedings on the basis that they might not be able to open up and start bringing in revenue in time to, to recover. Um, how concerned are you that we're, we're going to get into a real kind of downward spiral on this? Oh, I think, Kenny, well, personally, I'm very concerned. And I think we'll begin to see evidence of that downward spiral very quickly. Uh, as I understand it, the Chancellor of the Exchequer intends to taper, if you will, the furlough scheme. Uh, progressively from September, uh, from August, September and October, uh, progressively putting more and more pressure on employers uh, and stepping back from the responsibilities such as they were that, that they had, that the, that the Westminster government had taken on. Uh, and so I think we will, we all, as you say, we already see the beginnings uh, of a, a, a constant increase in the number of people who are losing their jobs. And I think as the furlough schemes are, are tapered by the Chancellor, uh, for no reason that I've, uh, that, no good reason that I've heard, apart from, I suspect, uh, Tory dogma, uh, the, the, that tapering effect will accelerate the rate of the loss of jobs. Uh, and, and certainly, as the, as the winter starts to appear, I think we will see the, the significant numbers of jobs being lost. And I think the estimates relating to the days of Mrs. Thatcher are probably on the, on the small C and large C conservative side. Uh, I think, the, the, as we know, the predictions that the combination of Brexit and COVID mean that uh, very few industry sectors are going to escape unscathed. Uh, that kind of breadth and depth uh, of, of economic vandalism is such that uh, I think we're going to see it, it's going to be a, 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 win, a, a jobs winter, the like of which we, 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 we only saw a little of during the 1980s. Yeah, um, Philippa, this is uh, one of these questions. We, we know that the economy wasn't perfect before the pandemic, but we did have relatively high employment. Um, there wasn't a, a kind of massive structural reason why we should see waves of unemployment this year. Uh, has, the, has the UK government just abandoned its responsibilities in, in kind of keeping the, the economy afloat, keeping people in their jobs? Uh, during this crisis? Well, I mean, we welcomed the furlough scheme uh, when it came in, but then we had a fight to try and get support for the self-employed. There's also the issue of the three million excluded who've, had, who've fallen through the cracks and had no support at all. Uh, and I'm part of the cross-party group that's working to get them recognised. But the problem is this is being wound down far too quickly. And, and therefore, all it's doing is kind of setting the redundancies back from spring to autumn. It's not actually going to preserve jobs. Particularly, there's been no differentiation for those sectors that are actually going to take quite a long time to recover, like tourism, like gymnasiums, like aviation and aerospace. They can't bounce back. There will be other sectors that have actually been very busy during uh, the pandemic, but there are some that we know could take a couple of years to respond. So if you were actually looking at job retention, then you would be looking at keeping this going, even if it was particularly protecting furlough in certain hard hit sectors. And the thing is, you say there wasn't really an issue before, but you know, we've had 10 years of austerity and it didn't work. You know, mm. what it does is what you end up 
doing is killing local economies. So the balance sheet might look better in Westminster, but no one has any money to spend. So your shops start shutting, they stop employing people, and you end with, up with this terrible downward spiral in your local economy. So what we had was far too many really poor quality jobs. Mm. You know, we had two thirds of children growing up in poverty had a working parent. And so the working poor had become really a key feature of these 10 years of austerity. And the fear from some of the language the, the chancellor has used is that he's actually going in the same direction. Now, he wouldn't even respond to uh, Kate Forbes' request just simply to allow her to use capital revenue that's not been able to be spent in the last five months to move it into resource, to allow it to support services. The big bonanza we had in his financial statement of 30 billion, we'd have been expecting about two and a half billion to Scotland in Barnet consequentials. But for economic stimulus, we got 21 million pounds. That wouldn't stimulate anything. So, you know, we really need the powers to come to Scotland or we need the funding to come to Scotland. I would prefer the powers, not just decisions made in London, because our economy and our country is a different structure from the southeast of England. And I think it is a decision that should be made here as to how you support our most important sectors. Mm. Well, we move on now and the latest recruitment figures show the number of speciality medical training posts which have been filled in Scotland is at its highest level for eight years. The data published by NHS Education for Scotland shows 738 of the 760 places on offer have been taken, representing a 7 percentage point increase on last year. Of the 17 specialist areas in which third year medical trainees can work, 13 are 100% full, including anaesthetics, internal medicine, clinical radiology and public health medicine. General practice fill rates have increased at 97% with 281 posts filled up from, sorry, filled up from 258 in 2019 and core psychiatry has seen an increase of 20 percentage points on 2019, reaching a 92% fill rate, the highest in over five years. Um, so, Philippa, this seems like uh, good news. Oh, yeah, absolutely. It's excellent news. You know, the NHS is very much a people service. Um, you know, it is doctors, nurses, ambulance drivers, physiotherapists. It's not about hospitals or machines. We may use those, but actually care and treatment is very much uh, person to person. And so that we've had a challenge over recent years of recruiting workforce. Obviously, we're very anxious about the loss of freedom of movement because we have a significant portion in health and social care who come from Europe. And we're, you know, there's been a 90% drop in European nurses coming to the UK. So hearing that within the medical spheres, we've had such a jump up and particularly in some very shortage specialties like radiology, I think this is really positive. And I think some of that may relate, it might sound bizarre to members of the public, to the experience that young doctors may have had during the pandemic. It has been incredibly hard on nursing and medical staff and other staff but certainly my experience being back in my local health board, being in touch with colleagues, is that there has been a very strong sense of camaraderie. There's been a lot of red tape that has disappeared. A lot of barriers that normally get in the way have, have crumbled. And so, and, and also our, our management here, it was covered on, on uh, the kind of television several months ago. They set up wellbeing centers in the hospitals to actually support staff. And I think it's these kind of things, feeling valued, feeling supported, having people recognize the work that you do, actually is where the job satisfaction comes from. If people feel it's all bits of paper and admin and bureaucracy or pointless tasks, that actually wears people down. So I think despite it having been an incredibly challenging half a year, I think actually young doctors will have seen the difference they could make to patients. And that's the thing that we all go into it to do. Yeah. 
Well, we move on now, and the Catholic bishops of Scotland, England and Wales have jointly condemned the possession and use of nuclear weapons in a pastoral letter today marking 75 years since the bombings of Hiroshima and Nagasaki. Recalling Pope Francis's words on his historic visit to Japan in November, the bishops stressed that the threat of mutual annihilation is completely incompatible with peacebuilding efforts. The letter goes on to state that the cost of such weapons should be measured not only in the lives destroyed by their use, but also the suffering of the poorest and most vulnerable members of society, who could have benefited if the money spent on weapons of mass destruction were instead devoted to the common good. Uh, and Andrew, we're, we're marking those anniversaries, uh, the 6th and the 9th of August 1945, were when the, the bombs were dropped on Hiroshima and Nagasaki. Um, what difference do you think it makes to have the, the, the bishops speaking out like this? Well, I think it's important that, uh, that, these, that these such important matters are not allowed to slide. Uh, I think the marking of such, such significant uh, anniversaries uh, of such terrible destruction uh, and keeping that in people's minds and keeping it uh, in people's considerations I think is very important. In and of itself, the, the, a letter from the bishops may not uh, may not persuade many in Westminster to change their position. Uh, however, in terms of communicating to their communities and to their flock, uh, and to keeping such important issues uh, uh, in the public domain and under consideration, I think is very important. And so, I think in that sense, the the bishops are to be applauded for taking that step today. Yeah, absolutely. Um... A massive explosion has rocked central Beirut, shattering windows, knocking down doors and shaking buildings several hundred feet away. The source of the blast, which appeared to occur around the Lebanese capital's port, is currently unclear. Witnesses have said that dozens were hurt and that hospitals were full of injured people. One witness driving past the port said he first saw fire from his window and then felt an enormous explosion that lifted the highway. Many people were feared to be trapped in rubble in the area immediately surrounding the explosion. Lebanon's health minister told journalists a ship carrying fireworks had blown up in the port, though the size of the blast heard across the country raised suspicions it might have resulted from a rocket strike or detonation of explosives, deliberate or otherwise. He confirmed that dozens were wounded but did not give further details of casualties. An enormous cloud of smoke could be seen from across the city and witnesses said there were reports of a fire and several smaller explosions at the port that preceded the large blast at around 6pm local time. And uh, Philippa, I don't know if you saw uh, the, the clips of this uh, explosion. There was a wee bit of footage that emerged um, and honestly it looked like, a, looked like a mushroom cloud. It was a gigantic explosion. Um, do you have any insight on what might have happened? Uh, I, I don't have any insight, obviously, um, but, uh, you know, when I, after spending some time in Gaza, I worked in Lebanon for a few months as mm -hmm. a volunteer, which was just after the war. And obviously the Lebanese have done a really kind of tough job in rebuilding their city, rebuilding their country. So I, I would hate to think that this was something deliberate, that it was a deliberate attack. I mean, obviously Lebanon has... Uh, undergone attack previously um, and I would hate to think it was that of course we won't know until there is more investigation but I hope it is accidental so that tragic as it is it's not the sign of uh, some new conflict beginning the people of Beirut and the people of Lebanon have been through enough in in the years yeah yeah I mean it's, it's a genuinely incredible uh, explosion we, we do understand the port has been destroyed uh, and is now kind of out of service completely. Um, so we will obviously uh, have another look at this as, as more reports come in and let you know what we find out. Um, but we move back to Europe now and Spain's former King Juan Carlos has expressed the desire to come back to Spain soon. Public broadcaster RTVE reported today, citing sources close to him. The palace announced yesterday that Juan Carlos, who abdicated in 2014 in favour of his son Felipe, was leaving the country so that his personal affairs related to allegations of bribes around a high-speed rail contract would not overshadow King Felipe's reign. Juan Carlos has been variously reported as being in Portugal or having travelled to the Dominican Republic via Portugal. 
Investigations continue into the part he played in the award of a multi-billion euro rail construction scheme in Saudi Arabia, as well as his Swiss bank accounts through which he reportedly received a gift of around £85 million from the Saudi monarchy. Uh, Andrew, um, this has been quite a, quite a wee story. Um, Juan Carlos, accused of all sorts of corruption, uh, seems to have fled the country. Now saying he, he will return and that he has he has issued a statement saying that he's he's still willing to talk to prosecutors, but of course he's in the Dominican Republic. It might be considerably harder to make him face those charges. Uh, Podemos has said that you know this is a, a, an argument for a republic. Do you think the the Spanish people will agree? Uh, Kenny, I, I I don't think that they will, at least at the moment, uh, at least as the story is understood just now and hasn't evolved further. I think I think it's a di it's a very difficult situation for the Spanish people. I think uh, folks of my age and slightly older will still probably hold Juan Carlos in some regard for his role in the peace, largely peaceful and ordered transition away from fascism. Uh, and a transition to a state which became part of the EU and which, in many respects, is 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 aligned with 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 the principles and the 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 the, the aspects of the EU which are which we regard as being very important. So, in that sense, uh, he he played a very important part. However, uh, the more recent events and the circumstances, uh, the allegations of of significant amounts of corruption. Uh, at a time when we've seen the rise of right-wing politics across Europe, including with Vox in Spain, uh, I think there, I think the, the monarchy and Juan Carlos will be under increasing pressure. The, the, the royal family will be under increasing pressure, uh, and I think uh, unless I think it is most likely that we will continue to see uh, uh, an ebbing away of support for the royal family in in Spain at, at the time at this time, as the allegations continue to unfold. Mm. And uh, Philippa, what's been your take on this? Do you think there's a a, a, a mood in Spain for for a change following this this scandal? I mean, Juan Carlos has not been uh, very popular at all in the last few years, uh, which is part of the reason for his abdication. Do you think this will uh, change change the mood in Spain? Um, I think that's hard to say. I, I don't really have information on that, but. You know, Andrew's comment reminds us that, you know, in, in the early 70s, when the UK was joining the EU, both Spain and Greece were still, you know, fascist states before they joined the EU. You know, I mean, the EU has played a big part in trying to move countries in Europe forward. The problem is what Juan Carlos also represents is this absolute corruption that you see among some of the most powerful elites and some of the most wealthy. And the problem is they're the ones who can wriggle off the hook. Um, and and that, that just isn't acceptable. But whether with Felipe being the actual monarch at the moment, it will more, I think, relate to his popularity and how he is seen rather than, you know, Juan Carlos, who's probably a bit more seen as a yesterday's man. I think they'll be more looking at him with regards to the corruption case rather than necessarily looking at him as their example of, of monarchy. Mm. Yeah, we will obviously keep an eye on that one. Uh, but back home, and the Home Office has said it will abandon uh, using a racist algorithm to process visa applications. The algorithm is said to have uh, profiled people such that people from certain countries were more likely to have their applications reviewed and rejected. Uh, Philippa, coming to you on this one, this uh, was a pretty shocking story that this algorithm that the Home Office uses just automatically sorted certain people from certain countries into a, a, a kind of bad pot and countries, people from certain other countries into a kind of, yes, they'll be fine. Um, it's probably not surprising to people to a lot of people that that, uh, that sorting does appear to have gone in large part according to the skin colour most common in those countries. Um, what, do, what do you make of this from the, the Home Office today? Well, I, you know, I think we're all aware of the hostile environment that was largely created in the Home Office 
when Theresa May was Home Secretary and, you know, has been maintained. We've had Windrush, we have had other scandals. Um, we see it not just in people, uh, you know, of, of colour, but there's definitely a degree of racial profiling and within individual countries. I mean, I'm involved in a breast cancer project still with Palestine. And while we may get a visa for young surgeons to come from the West Bank to train here uh, for a few months to get experience of a, working in a specialty unit or attending a course, it is a nightmare trying to get the equivalent visa for colleagues from Gaza. So, you know, you have these automatic blocks all the time. You know, it's difficult to get people out of Gaza within Israel. But the fact that the UK government is then not trying to reach out and make it easier for people who are providing key services to their own populations to come here, whether it's to study, to work, their, their actions towards spouses is terrible. You know, they're reinstating the, you know, the kind of income levels that actually you could have a British person who has lived abroad for a number of years, married, had a family, and will actually struggle to come back to the UK to settle. So it's almost like they also you lose their uh, citizenship and their right to settle here if they can't immediately earn above the threshold. So you could be having someone coming here for a couple of years away from their wife and children or their husband and children until they would qualify. So there's a general hostile environment. And obviously they have used this algorithm is, is, if you like, a, a physical exemplar of that hostile environment. Mm -hmm. Andrew, um, how, how much do you think this, this idea of sort of blaming the algorithm uh, is, a, is a, a, an almost abdication of responsibility by the Home Office? I mean, surely it's their job to make sure that the processes are fair. Uh, I think it's a complete abdication, Kenny, and, I, and it comes as no surprise. Uh, as you pointed out, and uh, sorry, and as, as we pointed out this evening, the the hostile environment that was pursued by the Home Office as a matter of dogmatic policy for uh, eleven years now, uh, and which has led to a, a succession of outrages, and which I personally felt gave was very clear evidence that to, if, if she was nothing else, Theresa May was by far the most racist Prime Minister we've suffered for many, probably for my lifetime. Uh, and the evidence of that approach is writ large and I think is now woven through the weft of the Home Office. Uh, their systematic approach to uh, people of colour, uh, British citizens of colour, uh, uh, which which culminated in the Windrush scandal are just are, are just is just the beginning of the it's just the tip of the iceberg of the way in which the Home Office has acted uh, in in such a such a an outrageous manner uh, year after year under under Tory under Tory governments uh, and so I think it's I think it comes as no surprise that we find that it's now woven through the code of the systems that they use. Uh, and that I think the, the the need to begin a proper examination and a written branch uh, uh, review of systems and processes and the principal principles, the 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 dogma that underlies uh, those systems and those processes is now long overdue. Uh, and I, I think with uh, in combination with the impending Brexit uh, and the the principles which appear to underpin much of the Brexit arguments. I think the time is now long overdue uh, to be considering the, the functioning of the Home Office and, 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 and seeking to, to begin the process of undoing all of the damage that's been done. Yeah, uh, Philippa, do you, do you get the feeling that scrapping this algorithm, you know, apologising for Windrush, do you, do you get the feeling that there is any a uh, change happening in the Home Office, or is is a lot of this just kind of firefighting, and and they're not really going to get to the the underlying problems? Um, well, I, I mean, I'm sorry. I think most of what they're trying to do is cosmetic. Um, you know, they make apologies for Windrush that sound like those people who apologize if you felt offended. You know, so in essence, it's your fault for feeling you need an apology. Um, you know, Pretty Patel at the dispatch box does not strike me as someone who has understood the need to actually carry out root and branch reform. 
and it is a reform of what your ideology and belief is. So, you know, exactly as Andrew was saying, you know, this this algorithm is something they chose or they developed and it fits with the hostile environment they've used. It particularly affects people from certain countries. There's obviously racial profiling. But what we're seeing with Brexit is we're just seeing that expanded to anyone who is from outside the UK. So anyone from Europe, particularly Eastern Europe, but also from other parts, other uh, Commonwealth countries. We've had families thrown out of Scotland who wanted to be here, who we want to have here. And one of the critical results of this is, is the threat to Scotland's population. You know, we have an aging population. We have a falling working age population. Scotland needs people and we want more people. So, you know, that's why we had the debate around a Scottish visa. It would still have been processed by the Home Office, but if someone actually wanted to come and live in Scotland, that would have given them additional points so that they could have made that choice. That was rebuffed. There's no recognition of what the loss of freedom of movement is going to be. I would have no difficulty if immigration was equalised up to make it easier, more dignified, more humane for everyone. But it's not, it's going to be equalized down that people who were able to come here from Europe will be treated as badly as people who are coming from elsewhere in the world. And with freedom of movement, we must never forget it worked both ways. You know, our young people have been able to go and live, study, work, love anywhere in 31 countries. And at the end of this year, they lose that ability. You know, my husband's German, I know mm what a difference freedom of movement made for us and i know what we're losing and again it all reflects this anti-foreigner narrative this hostile environment and that is what actually has to change you can't blame it on some piece of tech yeah well we move now to eastern europe and the authoritarian president of belarus alexander lukashenko has accused his opponents of trying to organize a massacre in the center of minsk as he seeks to shore up support ahead of the country's most unpredictable elections in a generation. In a speech, Lukashenko appealed to supporters' desire for stability and played up fears of a colour revolution backed by Moscow and hostile powers in the West. Without directly naming Russia, he repeated accusations that Moscow had sent mercenaries to destabilise the country, claiming that a new group of saboteurs had gathered in the south. Lukashenko, who has held power for a quarter of a century through a combination of populism and repression, is facing one of the toughest challenges of his career as he seeks a sixth term in office. The opposition has united behind Svetlana Tikhanovskaya, a reluctant stand-in for her husband, who is a popular YouTuber. Her campaign has gathered momentum in recent days and has held the largest political rallies in Belarus since the Soviet Union broke up. Andrew, um... What do you think of this from Lukashenko? Uh, you know, for a, for a dictator, he seems to be very paranoid about threats to his uh, threats to his power. Well, what can you say, Kenny? Dictators are going to dictate. Uh, I think these kind of behaviour patterns, uh, redolent as they are of President Trump, uh, don't come as a surprise from Lukashenko. His uh, his very personal style of, of, of dictatorship and of, of rule in, in Belarus uh, has been problematic for several years that he is now trying to deflect and point in several directions at once, contradictory though that might seem. It certainly sounds like the, the, the final days of a, of a paranoid dictator who, who, if he, who ought to know that the game is up and if he doesn't notice yet, he's about to find out. So I think it doesn't come as a surprise. One feels terribly for the for for Belarusians uh, who have suffered at the hands of uh, of, of Lukashenko. But uh, I think with the uni unity amongst the opposition and with the behaviour we're seeing from Lukashenko, I think I think the, the the there are good there are positive signs that his time in office may be coming to an end. Yeah, that election happens. Uh, I think in less than a week, so we will obviously let you know what happens there. But finally tonight, a new triple therapy treatment will be available to cystic fibrosis patients on the Scottish Health Service, following an agreement between the Scottish Government, NHS Scotland and the, phar and the pharmaceutical company involved. Caftrio, produced by Vertex Pharmaceuticals, is a medicine that tackles the underlying causes of the disease by helping the lungs work more effectively. 
Health Secretary Jean Freeman said, Cystic fibrosis is an inherited condition which tragically shortens lives and affects around 900 people in Scotland. I'm therefore very pleased that a revised pricing agreement has been reached between NHS National Procurement and Vertex Pharmaceuticals to ensure that Caftrio can be made available for the treatment of cystic fibrosis through the NHS. This is a potentially transformational treatment for cystic fibrosis and I'm delighted that patients in Scotland will be among the first in Europe to benefit and lead longer, healthier lives. Uh, I know this isn't your specialty, Philippa, but uh, this has to be welcome news as well, isn't it? Um, absolutely it is. I mean, uh, Vertex also were the producers of Orcambi, which was the first significant treatment uh, for cystic fibrosis, which could help about half of them. Um, and, you know, it's great to see now this triple therapy, which we hope will be an improvement. The problem was that the price that Vertex were setting what was simply almost unachievable. So I'm delighted that in their negotiations, um, the central procurement system of the Scottish NHS has managed to get what will still be a very high price, but something that they feel that we can invest in so that we can change the lives of the, the 900 cystic fibrosis sufferers who live in Scotland, and particularly those who are younger, where maybe getting on some of these therapies earlier in their lives will reduce the damage that happens. And that's obviously what we're hoping, is that by having access to drug therapy at an earlier point, you don't get the same lung damage that you would from uh, people who are, who are suffering from but, it, it, you know, this brings us back to one of the, the themes around, you know, trade deals with America, etc. In Scotland, all of our procurement for the NHS is carried out centrally. Uh, at the start of the pandemic in England, individual trusts, uh, their big hospitals, would tend to buy what they needed individually. We do it as a cohesive group. And that's something that the Americans are totally against because it does allow you to if you like, bulk buy and get a better price. Um, and this is one of the things that is threatened in, in an American trade deal and is something that both President Trump and in their trade papers, they had expressed that they wanted to stop central procurement. So this is something that we need to watch out for in these deals, we need to try and combat. And it was bitterly disappointing when the trade bill went through just before summer recess that both the amendments to protect high food standards and the amendments to protect the NHS were voted down by Conservative MPs. I don't know who they thought they were pleasing because most people value the NHS and most farmers value high food standards. So I don't know who it is they think they were pleasing here by voting those down, but that is a real concern going forward. Yeah. Well, that unfortunately is all we have time for this evening. Uh, just before we go, I do have to mention uh, we've just had a, a news flash. The hillside above the rest and be thankful has slipped the A83 and the road has been closed. So if you're up and heading that way, um, then be prepared for diversions, uh, holdups and whatever. Uh, that road, of course, we know has been a, a, a trouble spot for a long time, um, but that, that hillside has slipped um, in the heavy rain today. So just keep an eye out for that if you're in the area. Um, that is just about all we have time for. I do have to thank uh, Dr. Philippa Whitford and Andrew Wilson for joining us. And thank you at home for joining us as well. The shows would be completely pointless if you weren't watching. So thank you very much for that. If you're able to support us, uh, we do have to ask. If you can, please do go to broadcastingscotland.scot slash register. Sign up there as a supporter and your £5 a month is how we keep the lights on here at Broadcasting Scotland, how we continue to develop as a broadcaster to become the best that we can be. If you're not able to support us, we do understand the shows will always be free to view online, but you can still make a big difference for us. If you follow us on Twitter at Broadcast Scott, if you find us on Facebook, if you subscribe to our YouTube channel, uh, like the videos there and share the, share the shows around. Let people know why you watch Broadcasting Scotland and encourage them to give us a try as well. Uh, we can only succeed by building our audience and you're the biggest part of making that happen. Finally, if you'd like to get involved here at Broadcasting Scotland, we've said this several times, but we have lots of opportunities coming up, especially as we look towards the election next year. 
Uh, we want to have correspondents all over the country so that they can get to all the count centres so that whatever stories are happening around Scotland, we can have somebody on the ground uh, to help us get the best news out of it. So if you're interested in any way in getting involved in producing TV news or other TV shows, do please get in touch with us. We'd love to hear your ideas, your enthusiasm, what your skills are, what you want to learn about. Uh, we, can, we can adapt to all of that. And we have lots of things that we want to do here at Broadcasting Scotland. So do please get in touch. But that is absolutely all we have time for. I will be back again tomorrow at 7 with another Scotland at 7. But until then, thanks once again to Andrew and to Philippa. Thank you for joining us and have a great evening. Good night. Mm -hmm.